Charlie Kimball, thanks for joining us on Woodstock Community Television. You recently finished your third term in the House. Right. Uh, unsuccessful bid for Lieutenant Governor. Right. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your experience in the House and uh, what's next for you. Sure. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, so my name is Charlie Kimball. I live in Woodstock. So I serve three terms as a state representative representing Woodstock, Reading, and Plymouth. And it's, it was a great experience, and I decided at that point that I wanted to seek office um, at the lieutenant governor level so I could make more of an impact on things that were important to me. And the thing that drove me most of that was workforce development. And workforce development to me was important. A lot of things have been neglected across the state in terms of coordinating the efforts. Uh, so I really wanted to focus on that and use the office of the lieutenant governor to do that. And when I did that, the first thing that I ran into was, well, we need a workforce, but we also need a place for them to live. So housing was the major issue that I focused on in my lieutenant governor campaign. It wasn't what I focused on in the House as a member of the House. I was focused on economic development, focused on workforce development, uh, focused on rural economic development, and those things that were around those, whether it was recreational trails and trying to make it easier to permit those trails uh, as part of the recreational economy and the rural economy, very important. And to make it easier to do developments in uh, villages and downtowns so that we could have more concentrated housing and really preserve that character of our Vermont landscape. So it was a, I found the most um, joy, I would say, and the most benefit from being um, that doing constituent services and helping people that didn't know how to navigate government, that said, I'm in trouble, I need help, how can you help me? And in some cases I could, in some cases I couldn't. And when I could, it felt very fulfilling uh, to be able to help somebody out of a jam or to just help navigate, whether it was, you know, how do I get a passport um, because I need to go somewhere, or uh, the insurance for my daycare center just got uh, suspended, how do we open, uh, or uh, things such as that. So that, for me, was very fulfilling to be able to leverage that. So you, you mentioned housing and workforce development. What are some of the challenges and obstacles uh, that Vermont faces? Yeah, it's, right now we've got enough jobs who don't have enough workers. Um, so the, when I was running for lieutenant governor, I was in touch with the statistics on a daily basis. But um, earlier this year, there were 28,000 job openings. And uh, that's a lot. And there are 20,000 fewer people in the workforce today than there were before the pandemic uh, because of people retiring from work, uh, deciding they didn't want to do the same job anymore. Um, and then businesses shifted. Um, they had to shift because of the pandemic and they changed how they did business. And, but there's still a lot of openings throughout the state, so there's a good job. So the question is, can we fill those jobs with people that are in Vermont? In some cases, the answer is yes. Um, our workforce participation rate dropped from about 67% down to 60%, and that means those who are eligible of working age who could be in the workforce have stepped out of the workforce. So that's a 6% drop. So that's pretty significant. Is that mostly retirement or, or what? Hard to know. There's no good numbers around as to why they're not working anymore. Um, anecdotally, I have people that are my contemporaries from high school and college that have retired and they're 58 years old. They've just figured out that they want a different kind of life and they've uh, arranged their lives so they can do it. So there's a lot of people that I know personally that have done that. I know some early retirements, uh, but statistically, it's hard to know exactly where those people have gone. And when people say, well, where did everybody go? I'm like, well, you know, there's a lot of reasons. And there was a big shift. You know, people left jobs that they didn't like or that didn't pay them enough to do the kind of job that they were doing, so they wanted to do something else. Um, so that's part of it. In terms of housing, you know, the stuff that we put in motion in the past couple of years uh, in the legislature, making it easier to do, uh, do priority housing projects in village centers or neighborhood development areas and uh, downtowns, and also all the federal money. That's gonna result in a lot of new housing units over the next five years. So we're gonna see a lot of that, but it hurts right now because we don't have that housing. Vermont's an attractive place for people to move to or have a second home. Um, so that pressure from people moving into Vermont from outside of the state has been significant in ter terms of driving up the price and taking 
primary housing stock off the market or out of the availability for rent or for ownership. So that's been really a market force that has impacted people's everyday lives. So there's people that have jobs here that can't find housing here and they move because they can find someplace that's either cheaper or someplace that is a, a better housing, uh, a level of housing that they can afford. Mm. So it's it's really frustrating from that standpoint. In the next uh, year or two, is still going to be difficult uh, in terms of meeting that housing shortage. But five years down the road, I think we're in good shape. So what are, what are the best solutions near term to get more, more housing online? Oh, it, has, it just takes time. I mean, there's, uh, there's some real creative solutions, which are really great. Um, there's home share, which enables people to stay in their homes longer by sharing a part of their home with somebody else. Uh, the Woodstock uh, Senior Center is spearheading that in a local area, but that's a, a statewide initiative and trying to just make it so that more people can live under a roof. The accessory dwelling units and some of the uh, regulations that are changing at a local level. Um, the regional planning commissions are helping towns rewrite their town plans and their zoning to make it easier to have accessory dwelling units or denser developments. And that's all great. Um, and we have this, something called the VHIP program, Vermont Housing Investment Program, and that provides uh, owners of apartment buildings with money uh, to help return that vacant or blighted property to productive use. That's great money. It's $20 million we put into that program. Um, it's going to take time for that to wind its way through, too. So all these things take time. But those are some things that we've done in the legislature um, you know, I look at the abandoned houses around the state, and it just amazes me. In every town, you can find them in every single town where someone has just left the house either because they moved away, um, maybe they uh, someone died and it's just empty. Uh, I know of a couple properties where someone bought the house because they just wanted to own it and they haven't done anything with it. I think there's an opportunity to take advantage of those vacant or abandoned houses and return them into productive use without having to build new stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's there are some things that could be done, and I know the housing groups are working on them. And I know that Act 250 comes up for a lot of criticism from some some sectors yep. uh, as impeding development. Yep. Uh, what's your take on that? Are there areas where Act 250 can be or needs to be reformed? Yeah, it's every year in the legislature we look at reforming Act 250 to make it easier to permit otherwise uh, acceptable projects. And I think it's the administration of Act 250 which is the most egregious in terms of holding back projects that otherwise would have been approved. Um, and some of that is because of the process of um, that we've baked into the system of having um, people who own property that abuts them as being uh, interested parties. Um, and party, they're given party status, and that can really hold up the process. But we have to look at the whole permitting process, not just Act 250, but also local permits. Someone who is a talented uh, lawyer or someone who knows the system can hold up a project for a long time. Um, you can do it on a local permit challenge, the water permits challenge, the zoning permits challenge, everything. Um, and so there's, there's many places where projects can be uh, held up. And so I think it's, uh, it's a couple things. One is Act 250, yes, the administration of Act 250 has to be improved. Um, there's, there is a, uh, an appetite on the case on the part of some to increase the jurisdiction of Act 250 over uh, projects. I don't think we need to do that. Um, we need to keep the jurisdiction where it is, but make it easier and more predictable as to going through that permit process. The governor had an idea about how to do that two years ago. Didn't uh, sell with the legislature. The legislature came up with an idea this year. It was a huge idea about how to re uh, reform the administration of Act 250. The governor didn't like that. So he'll probably come back this year with trying to come up with some kind of compromise. A lot of the same players are still in the legislature that have scars from those battles in years past. And I hope that they can come to a compromise this year on that. And so this coming session, you're not going to be there, oh. which seems like a big loss for the legislature since you brought a lot of uh, business experience and thinking mm. uh, to these 
to these problems. Are you trying to find a way to, or what's next for you? Are you, yeah. are you going to be in a position to, to help Vermont with these challenges that you've been involved with for the past six years? Well, yeah, I think I'll, I'll miss the policy work um, in trying to address some of these things. You know, we spent a lot of time last year on workforce development. So I'm still involved a little bit with some of those things. Um, and following up on some legislation that we passed last year to see is it being put in place now. Um, and it's always interesting to see what you pass is in the legislature and then nothing happens with it. Like, oh, let's go back. And so I'm, I'm doing some revisiting of that. Um, and there's great people. It's great to have new and fresh ideas um, that come into the legislature. Um, so it's, for me, I don't know what the next step is. Uh, I'm taking a step back to say, well, you know, uh, maybe it's not politics. Maybe it's actually working on some of these projects. Um, I had come up with a campaign of the uh, Phoenix 251 project, which was to take those abandoned houses and return them pr to productive use. That's still an idea in the back of my head, and then I might pursue something like that. In the meantime, I'm working. I got a job full time in, in software development and, and uh, publishing. So that's keeping me busy. And uh, in the meantime, I just keep my hand in local things. Yeah, and you are still the rep until uh, yep. the, your successor is sworn in in January. Right. So are you still fielding constituent calls and? Yep. Yeah. Yes, uh, and happy to do it. And so I've been working with some people on some local projects. Um, also, I did have some direct constituent help with someone that did run into an insurance issue, and the committee I served on oversaw the Department of Financial Regulation, so uh, that helped knowing who to call. And I think that's the thing, as you know, from being a legislator is that just knowing who to call, it makes 100% of the difference. And when you have the name or the title representative in front of your name, they return your calls yeah. <laughs> or they send you an email. And, and I got to say that um, I found state government to be very responsive. A lot of people will always throw the government under the bus, but the people in government for the most part, uh, work hard, they're dedicated, they care about the state, um, and they return emails and text messages and phone calls late at night, and it's like, ah. So I have a lot of respect for what uh, people working in the state government do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think government often gets a bad rap. Yeah. Um, sometimes for good reason, yep. but I think here in Vermont, I mean, it's a citizen legislature. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, it's just people you'd run into in the grocery store, and they're just trying to do their best. Like, no one's in it to make money or try to game the system. Yeah. Uh, and it seems like a lot of people don't realize the power they have to be involved in local politics yeah. and make a change. Um, it's easier to complain. Yeah, and the funny thing is, too, um, it's amazing how much impact a simple email or a phone call to a representative has. Um, because you, I think most people think, oh, they're too busy. Well. They don't get that many emails, or so when some when I hear representatives say, "I'm getting a lot of emails on this." Well, how many? Well, like five. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, all right. Um, so it's it's really easy to make an impact and have that voice as a citizen, and reaching out to the representative and say, "Hey, I feel strongly about this." The representative may not agree with you, but uh, you can make your case known. So we're filming this uh, a few days before the midterm election uh, and the statewide election, and this video will probably come out right about the time of the election. Mm. Uh, how, how are you feeling right now about the prospects for Vermont? It, it seems like the, the Democrats will maintain their large majorities in the House and Senate, yeah. possibly veto override numbers, uh, and the election is Phil Scott's to lose. So it looks like we're gonna be, have mostly the same uh, makeup of government in terms of yeah. Democratic legislature, Phil Scott on the fifth floor. Uh, is, do, you, do you think this kind of balance serves Vermont well? Uh, does, it, does it create friction and conflict that prevents good legislation from getting passed? What, what's been your experience working with a Republican governor? You know, I, th I think Vermonters do want balance, and they don't want um, the windmill to tilt uh, exceedingly in either direction. And they really want to have that um, uh, honest and open debate about issues as to 
as it could on either side of the aisle. Um, and so it is healthy to have that. And we have in Vermont, at least in recent memory, always had a governor of one party and a lieutenant governor of the other party, too, uh, because of that balance. And the legislature is predominantly Democratic now, and there's still a lot of factions within that Democratic Party. So it's not like it's all people stepping or just falling into line. Um, and I think that pro some progressives have now joined the Progressive Party because they didn't find they had a big enough voice. The Democratic voice. Party. The Democratic Party, yeah. yes. I've joined the Democratic Party because they didn't feel like they either had enough voice or maybe the tent was big enough in the Democratic Party for them to be part of it. And so the most difficult part, I think, for the Democratic Party is to figure out how to govern uh, as a legislature because it would be it's easier to stand up as a block and vote against or for something when it uh, when you don't have to worry about the consequences of it. But when you do, you have to really consider, okay, if this goes through, what are the implications going to be? And so that is, I wouldn't say a burden, but that is a responsibility of the party that has a majority. But then the legislature, there's going to be, what, nine new committee chairs at least uh, in the House. Uh, a third of the Senate is turned over, a new uh, lieutenant governor, new president pro tem in the Senate. So it's uh, there's going to be a lot of shifting and a lot of figuring out uh, what to do. and So you'll see some of the same old issues come back up that didn't uh, pass. You know, last year, the governor vetoed um, a study on safe injection sites. He studied the clean heat standard uh, or vetoed the clean heat standard. So there will be, uh, there'll be some of those issues that come back. The paid family medical leave uh, was one that yeah. he vetoed. And, failed by one vote in the House to override his veto. So I can see some of those things coming back that the governor's going to have to figure out, can he navigate before it gets to a vote uh, in the House and the Senate as to what his position is? And he's been pre pretty bad at that, yeah. um, to be really upfront about it. And even the, the bill on the clean heat standard that he vetoed the legislature listened to what he had been saying in his public statements, adjusted the bill to say, okay, uh, once the Public Utility Commission comes up with something, it has to be approved by the legislature. And when he, his veto message said, I don't like anything just approved by the Public Utilities Commission without the legislature approving it. So it's like, ah. So he, he has to learn how to govern better with a larger majority in the House um, if he's going to be effective, um, or, he's, or if he's just going to uh, govern by veto, because mm -hmm. that that balance could change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think the legislature could improve its messaging to the public? For example, the clean heat standard, because it seems like it's too easy for the opposition to just say, "Oh, it's a carbon tax. It's it's going to make life more expensive for the people who can least afford it." Yeah. And that has a tendency to spook. Yep. folks running for office, right? Um, because it's a very complicated issue. It is, and it's it's hard to like meet that criticism with, you know, a complex rebuttal that yeah. can convince someone. Yeah, I mean, we had uh, you know an incredibly uh, productive communications team in the House as to just sending out the messaging on every vote that got passed. Uh, to try to communicate through social media, p press releases, everything. I don't know how the legislature can do a, a better job of getting uh, getting the message out. It might be simplifying the message to as to how it directly impacts people. Um, because you're right, it is easy to call the clean heat standard a carbon tax. Because uh, what is it going to do? It's essentially going to end up with higher prices on any kind of... Uh, uh, fuel that has carbon in it. So it's like, uh, all right. Um, so it's hard to get away from calling it a carbon tax because in the end, that is what it is. It's a tax. Uh, and if you really want to be honest with the, with the public, you can say, yes, you're going to pay more. And that's going to incent you to save. Uh, but that's a losing argument. Um, yeah. But it's the right argument. So it's, like, it's really hard to know what the right message is as to what to be honest, an honest broker, and also to uh, so that people understand and to uh, pass the right policy. Mm -hmm. are, are, are ideas like the clean heat standard, uh, do you think that these are the best, most effective ways that Vermont can 
deal with climate change and mitigate the effects of climate change? What other ideas are being floated? Well, I mean, we talked about weatherization um, and the best way to reduce uh, Vermont's consumption of fossil fuels. Uh, and you've got transportation and, and home heating. Uh, and those are the two largest categories. And we've done such a poor job of uh, weatherizing homes and providing better insulation at a pace necessary to really achieve the goals we've already committed to. Uh, so to me, that's the biggest opportunity for the state is to look at how do we ramp up weatherization. It comes down to we don't have the workforce to do it. Uh, and if we really want to achieve our goals, we'd have to in, uh, weatherize 90,000 homes. And uh, we're doing about 1,500 a year. So in 60 years, we're going to be there. It's and just... then, by then, it might be warm enough that we won't have to weatherize. <laughs> exactly. Well, there is, except it would be too hot in the summer. You know? yeah. So it's, uh, you would definitely have to invest in the, in the workforce to weatherize homes. And that comes back to uh, what are we doing around the workforce? The governor was late to the table um, last year and starting to embrace what we saw in the legislature as a need to focus on um, the career and technical education and really providing a, a cleaner path for people coming out of our high schools uh, to get the skills they need to have a very successful career in Vermont in the jobs that we need without incurring a lot of college debt. So we had focused on that as a legislature. The governor came to that table last year, finally, um, and has put a focus on it. But it was slow. So now we're kind of in the area where we are. Uh, but yeah, so the clean heat standard was very complicated. And uh, putting the pressure or the burden really on wholesalers to figure out how to reduce the amount of um, fossil fuels being consumed by their customers. Um, and the, the weatherization is a lot easier to understand. Like we're going to have um, homes that are better insulated, um, that have better heating systems, so that you're more comfortable, spend less to actually heat the home. Um, it's just a matter of getting the workforce to be able to do it. Yeah. It's tough work. It yeah. is tough work. Well, and especially with regard to climate change, I think finding solutions the challenge of finding solutions is compounded by the fact that a lot of people still aren't convinced that it's even a thing that's happening, man-made climate change. Mm. So how do you overcome that to get to the point where you can have a, a serious conversation about the price of fossil fuels and yeah. how to minimize use of fossil fuels? It's Yeah, I, I don't know. You're right, yeah. because even those that are willing to admit or accept that yes, our climate is changing. They're not willing to accept that we can change that. Um, and if, if you accept the first, but don't believe that you can change things, then why change what you're doing? Um, but it is, uh, uh, it is clear that we have climate change. The scientists <laughs> give us the evidence. We see it every day, um, whether it's you know, tick season that lasts for a lot longer or Maple sugaring season being compounded, ski season being shorter, all that kind of stuff. 70 degrees in November. 70 degrees, yeah. I mean, they've got a World Cup ski race at Killington in two weeks or three weeks, and um, they'll be lucky if it's cold enough in order to make the amount of snow they need to. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so there's definitely climate change, and can we slow down that pace of climate change through actions? And you have to believe yes. Um, interestingly, you know, the United States uh, emits more CO2 in the atmosphere, I think, in one year than <laughs> Pakistan does throughout its entire history. So it's interesting to look at the disparity between a developed nation like us and developing nations uh, in other parts of the world that um, are on this different trajectory in terms of their economics, in terms of their uh, equal opportunity for their citizens, and just where climate change fits into that. Mm -hmm. Well, shifting gears a little bit, uh, one, of the, one of the things we cover here on the TV station is the local Economic Development Commission mm. meetings. Yeah. I've been impressed with how uh, a small local volunteer group of people has come together and put good ideas into practice. Uh, and it reminds me that it takes more than just sending people up to Montpelier 
to make things happen, we have to get involved in our local communities and find creative ways of developing our local economies. Yeah. Um, and I know that's something that you've been involved with, you've sort yeah. of been a liaison between the state and the town of Woodstock in getting some of these things happening. Uh, are, there, are there things happening in Woodstock that the people of Woodstock are doing with a little help from Montpelier that uh, are exciting to you in terms of economic development here and housing? Yeah, I, 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 uh, it's interesting. A, a, a small group of people can change the world. You know, uh, that is the key to it. And dedicated people are not in it for their own interests. They're in it because um, they want to make the community better and help people in their community. So I, I was one of the founding members of the Economic Development Commission and had chaired it for a number of years beforehand. And um, I like the direction that they've gone in terms of making big bets and saying, what are the biggest issues that we have um, and how can we address those? So um, interestingly, the focus on child care and housing and what um, Woodstock is doing around that, um, also the participation with uh, new business formations, is to figure out where does economic development uh, start and where does you know, private initiatives um, begin. And there's often an overlap between them. And in, in the end, economic development is making sure you have the right infrastructure in place and the right uh, access to markets or, um, and whatnot for somebody who is involved with a private enterprise or maybe it's a public enterprise can actually carry out what their plan is. So I think infrastructure is key. But housing is part of that key infrastructure at this point. And looking at uh, funding accessory dwelling units, um, looking at some of the, uh, we did a housing study as part of the Economic Development Commission a few years ago and appointed to the number of units that we would need and uh, pointed to a couple of things. So that has led to some of these discussions now about housing and that's great to have. Uh, and dedicating funds to uh, help that happen is great. And focusing on childcare. Um, so the state's focused on child care. Uh, I think the uh, Economic Development Commission first, when it made a $50,000 grant to um, Rainbow Preschool or Play School uh, for the purchase of that property and development of it, that was a big thing for the town to do. Uh, and other towns have taken notice. Um, there's a new project, or it's not new anymore. It's up in Randolph uh, that's being held, led by the Economic Development Commission. Uh, to, to locate a regional child care hub and critical for the area because uh, child care is a necessary element of people's work and their life. Um, so they're focused on that. It was interesting, not to digress too far, in the legislature we had the Economic Development Commissions come and talk to us about this is what we need in order to look at the economic development in this part of the state. And the conversation always used to be about what kind of economic incentives can we give a company to relocate here or what kind of tax breaks can we give them um, and or can we reduce the regulatory burden. That was always the discussion. In the last two or three years it's been, we need child care. Like, that's a total shift. And uh, I remember having one regional director or director of a regional economic development commission at our table and I said, wait a minute. So you're focusing all of your organization's attention towards childcare and not tax incentives or, yes. Like, okay, different game. Yeah. So um, that was instructive, I think. Yeah, so why do, why do you think that this has, has popped up as an issue so recently in the last two to three years? Like what was the, what was the light bulb that went off that made people realize, oh, childcare? This is what we need to be focused on. Yeah, and I remember a few years ago when um, one of the regional planning commissions was talking about how child care was such a um, in dire need. And um, a few things have happened with uh, child care. And uh, one is that there's not as many child care facilities as there were in the past. And some of that is some of the regulatory requirements as the education level um, for the people that are providing that care. Um, so that's one of the issues, and you have to look at carefully at can you ease some of those regulatory requirements 
um, without reducing the quality of the child care for the health and safety of the child, but also the educational development. So that's one of the issues. Um, the other is looking at your workforce for child care. And uh, there was a child care center in White River Junction that closed, not because they had a lack of demand, but because they didn't have staff. Um, and, and, and they had money, too. So it wasn't any of those economic pressures that you would face, but it was just workforce. Um, and so that's been an issue. There's a reduction of number of spaces because of lack of personnel. So that's like two of the things that have contributed to that. Um, and the other is we talked about with the participation rate in the workforce. Uh, perhaps we're seeing a lower participation rate because people can't find child care. Um, and that will impact the employers directly as well. So it's, it's all kind of mixed in. We've got companies, um, I can't think of specifically who they are now, but that have looked at providing child care on site or at least subsidizing somebody else's child care to get them up and running. Um, so it, it's really, um, it's, there's no easy fix to it except for providing more child care slots um, and more child care providers. And to do that, we have to have more people either entering the field or staying in the field. You know, somebody gets into the child care field, pay typically isn't very good and there are no benefits. So they have the same education level as someone that would enter the public school system where they get great benefits mm -hmm. and better pay. So why would they stay in child care? Maybe flexibility of their schedule? So it's really, really so, hard. So does it ultimately come down to the state or the feds subsidizing to the child care workforce? I mean... Yeah, do you subsidize the centers? Do you subsidize the individuals that have to pay for it? And so we've increased our child care assistance, uh, our ch child care, CCFAP, child care financial assistance program um, in terms of increasing the amount that parents um, have access to. Like, um, so that's, that helps, but that doesn't necessarily help the child care center. Um, I met with somebody in Bristol and they run the child care center in Bristol. And their constraint is the lack of a uh, septic system that can handle more kids. So they need access to money to increase their capacity for their septic system so they could have more kids. So that's part of the solution is being really creative about how to help these child care centers work. Um, so. Uh, you know, I've talked to an, other operators of child care centers. So it's great that you get, make it more affordable for someone to send their kid, but we can't operate on what they're paying us now. So we have to actually increase our rates, but we can't do that without losing our... So it's this delicate balance as to do you provide more subsidies to the parents or do you provide subsidies to the child care centers themselves, either from a national or state basis. In the state, we have limited resources. Nationally, there's more resources, but it's borrowing for the future generation. Um, but that's when we look at the benefits of different programs, there's more benefit to having a well-educated, well-cared-for youth than there is in many areas where you're spending money. So it's a good investment. Um, so, yeah, it's perhaps making hard choices of what else not to fund to the same degree. Segwaying to education in general, mm. uh, it's a, ne a never-ending debate Always. about uh, funding, governance. What's your sort of high-level assessment of Vermont's education system mm. in terms of, of how it's funded, how it's governed, um, especially in light of Act 46? Yeah, so uh, there's a few things, I guess. Uh, one is we're the, one of the only states, I think we're the only state that relies so heavily on the um, statewide education property tax. Um, and while many will decry that tax as being unfair, we also have 70% of the people are eligible for some kind of adjustment to their property tax based on their income. So there's already a uh, some progressivity built into that tax so people may be paying what they can afford to pay. That's often lost on people, um, and so it's important to note that. There was a proposal to set up a regional 
uh, income tax, the Tax Structure Commission reported two years ago, um, so that people voting on the regional income tax would have more um, impact that they could identify with what the school tax is going to do on their personal uh, income or on their tax liability uh, than the property tax current does, currently does. Um, so that was an idea that was floated out there. The legislature is going to take it up this year as uh, should we move towards this. And it's complicated, like most of all these things. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's the biggest, the biggest issue that we have with Act uh, 60 and 68 is trying to make it so that local voters um, will hold down spending on the, their school budgets because they will have that impact on their, on their taxes, but because of the adjustment on the property taxes that, to income and the complexity of trying to figure out where you're gonna pay in your tax bill, it's almost impossible to figure it out. When you're going in to vote on the school budget, what's this gonna to do to my taxes? Like, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so anyway, so it's, it's overly complex. Our, our system is um, you know, ranked really well throughout the country in terms of usually fifth or sixth in terms of the quality of our education. Um, but let's look at our school um, infrastructure. Uh, we've got at least $500 million in um, school construction projects that have been identified already. Woodstock alone is over $70 million in rebuilding a school that really needs to be replaced. Um, and so it's, how do you fund that? And Massachusetts has a pretty good system uh, where they have a portion of their sales tax revenue go directly into a school construction fund and that schools have to apply in order to have funds released to that construction project. And, and it's like a good, better, best type of thing you can choose from. So that seems like it's a really good structure, and Vermont will look at that. So we're almost done assessing the, um, assessing the quality of the facilities themselves, and that report is coming due, and the legislature will have to act on that. Um, but that's uh, one of the things that's in the mix. So education, I mean, if you want to talk about attracting people to the state, someplace to live, a solid education system for their kids, um, quality of life, those are the things that are going to bring people here. Mm -hmm. And so we can't ignore um, and can, cannot afford to ignore that we need to continually look at how to improve the quality of our education, but also make it sustainable so we can afford it. Some of these issues that we're talking about, uh, economic development, workforce, housing, ha has broad appeal across party lines. Um, does this bode well for the success of, of these initiatives? Are there still areas, wedge areas, that uh, you know Republicans and Democrats disagree on that sort of get in the way of, of moving forward on these? Or is it mostly just, are the challenges mostly around the complexity of the challenges themselves and the expense? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think there is, you know, universal agreement on a lot of these being the key issues that face the state. And the solutions are different um, among different folks, but in the, in the legislature, it's really common for things to come out of a committee with a unanimous vote in support of it, and when it goes to the, um, to, for the whole House to look at it, then receives overwhelming support. Um, except on key um, issues where there's more of a national political uh, agenda at stake. So I think that it is in the details, um, you know, in trying to figure it out. So school uh, education financing is complex. Everybody knows it. I mean, even with um, recent Supreme Court ruling for Maine that said you have to fund uh, religious schools with public dollars and have people with the ability to do that, well, what does that really mean? And so Vermont held off on doing something in the last legislative session to figure out how the court case was going to turn out. And now the legislature's going to figure it out. Uh, yeah, this is an interesting one. So what, what if you were going back to Montpelier next yep. year, what, what path would you want to want to take with that? Because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of room for maneuvering. Yeah, so in my heart, uh, you know, I've been a fan of school choice all along, and uh, that certainly doesn't fit well with uh, the Democratic Party platform, but 
um, I grew up in Brownsville or went to, uh, when I lived in Brownsville, went to high school, I had school choice and chose to go to Woodstock High School and, and recognize that, um, you know, the, the school that's closest to the child may not be the best school for them. And so that makes sense to have school choice at some level. So does that apply to religious schools? And in some cases, the local religious school is going to be the best option. Um, but we still have to, we have to expect any school that receives public dollars to then toe the line in terms of who are they going to accept, uh, what are the conditions of employment, um, because there have been you know, passes given to religious schools in the past as to what is, um, how do they handle people with uh, disabilities, uh, both physical and mental. Um, we, we can't subsidize um, a school that isn't going to be open and willing to take in students of all uh, talents and uh, interests. So I think that's the most important point. Mm -hmm. If somebody has school choice, great, but that school has to be uh, subject to the same scrutiny that a public school does. So could Vermont hypothetically say that public dollars only go to schools that accept kids who are on an IEP? Yep. And, and could that be a sort of solution to the Supreme Court decision? It absolutely can. And Is that realistic? Is that achievable? A lot of the independent schools that receive public taxpayer money now already are meeting those uh, requirements, whether it's Sharon Academy or the classic academies, whether it's Burn Burton or uh, St. Johnsbury Academy, Linden, Linden uh, Academy. Um, so they're already, or Linden Institute, they're already meeting those requirements. So yes, there is, a, there is an example of it working. Uh, not every school is going to be able to meet that. Um, and that's, that's the challenge. You know, it's one thing about school choice. Um, does that, you know, right now, with a high school, with a town with, a, uh, with no high school, there's very little um, in terms of where, that, where the expectations are. So anyway, that's a, that's a rabbit hole. Probably shouldn't get down. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything that you really want to talk about that we haven't covered? You know, if, you, if you look at what always comes up in the legislature every year, uh, there are three ways to look at it. One is looking at what has happened in the past, uh, and that is legislation that didn't get brought up or didn't pass and is a, a favorite of a returning member. Um, another is looking at those things that have been vetoed by the, uh, by the governor as something that's going to come up again. Or that long, long laundry list of uh, things that were passed by the legislature that uh, there was a study committee formed or uh, someone was charged with looking into something and they come back to the legislature and it are, is there going to be action taken on it? So for some of that stuff, um, one of the things that I think is important for the legislature and for the governor and for our citizens to look at is the information technology projects across state government um, that um, are incredibly expensive, and they also uh, often fail, as a lot of computer implementation projects do. Uh, we have a big one with the unemployment insurance uh, area. Uh, we had something simple that just failed, <laughs> and that is uh, creating a one-stop portal for businesses to be able to look at how to register, how to pay taxes, all oh, that yeah. kind of stuff. A couple million dollars into it, and the contractor then failed to deliver, mm -hmm. bottom line. Uh, it's not the first time the Department of Motor Vehicles, you may remember, had this uh, entire project of probably 10 years ago, spent $8 million on it, and ultimately it failed, and the state sued the contractor, and it got paid back. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of those things that we know are critical for the operation of government. Um, they're not sexy. Uh, it's not going to be a headline unless it fails. Um, so it's, it's important that the, there's follow through on those projects. Um, and so I think that's one place where it's really important for us to hold the government feet to the fire and saying, mm -hmm. how are we doing there? Yeah. Yeah. I remember the Vermont Health Connect debacle. Yes. Yeah. Right. And it's hard to explain to constituents like, 
Yeah, yeah. it's rough. Yeah. yeah, we decided to come up with our own system instead of using the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Vermont politics traditionally has been very civil. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Democrats, Republicans in the House and Senate uh, get along well for the most part. Sometimes disagreements flare up, uh, and there are you know handfuls of people on either side that are less civil. But for the most part, uh, we have a very friendly dialogue um, between Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. Nationwide, this seems to be falling apart uh, to a greater and greater extent. Uh, and people are just backing into their corners. It's becoming more tribal. Do you, do you worry that this, this partisan chasm will sort of creep into Vermont politics, or do you think we'll be able to, to hold it together and, and keep debates civil and, and focused on finding solutions for Vermonters? Um, I think it's here, and we already have that kind of divide. Um, I certainly have encountered that myself going around the state and campaigning, um, having a nice conversation with someone until uh, he asked what party I was from. And when I said I was a Democrat, then the conversation, the tone and everything changed immediately. And that was not an isolated incident. Um, so that definitely is here. And it's about con preconceived notions of what somebody stands for with a label on them um, and what somebody on a national level is trying to paint that person into. And um, on the street um, this past weekend, somebody came by and was disparaging um, the, the Republican Party. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, there's, we're talking about people, our neighbors, and let's, let's be a little more cautious about that. And, uh, and open, and so it's definitely here. Um, I think at the, we've seen it in, in different communities throughout Vermont. I'm, I am optimistic that we'll be able to work through it and that Vermont will focus on the pragmatic solution to our common problems and that we're gonna do that well. So yeah. it'll be ugly though in some parts mm -hmm. and we'll get through it. All right, well to leave things on a brighter note, uh, what, are you, what are you most optimistic about um, about just being a Vermont citizen as you look into the future? Yeah, I think Vermont is really well placed for um, the future in terms of its econo economy. Um, we've got a pretty good diversity between tourism, manufacturing, um, service sector, education, medicine. Uh, we have a very uh, enviable position in terms of the clean water and clean air that we have. Uh, and we're attracting people to come to Vermont that way. And I'm excited about the work that is being done around housing issues uh, with people that are in that area as uh, organizations like the Vermont uh, Housing Finance Agency and Vermont Housing Conservation Board. And they're doing incredible work. And locally, uh, Twin Pines Housing Trust, they're doing great stuff that's gonna meet the needs of people in terms of their housing. So I think there's, we're working on those larger issues and pr trying to provide solutions for them. So I think the future is bright for the state and that it's uh, because of the dedicated work of all those individuals and organizations. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. All right. And folks like you who have you know, de dedicated a part of your life to service mm. in the house. Um, Back so at you. <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't one of my representatives. I live in Barnard, but yep. um, thank you for your years of service to the community and uh, hope that you will and trust that you will remain engaged on a lot of these issues that you've been working on for the past few years. Well, thank you, Tab. Thank you. Right. Thanks for joining us. It's been a pleasure. All right. All right.